down. There we go. So yeah, um, we're gonna start out with introductions so we can all get to know each other and um, a little icebreaker. And to, while you introduce yourself, um, say your name, pronouns, and why don't you let us know where you are today? Um, as I said, we're all over the place. So it's kind of cool to hear where everybody is. Um, and yeah, Ellen just dropped our icebreaker in the chat. And as many of us have read Rivermouth, um, we hear there are often references to spirituality and um, Alejandra, your relationship to uh, sacrifice and divinity as it relates to your work in translation. Um, and one of our good friends has recently like been asking, starting this conversation about spirituality with us in really simple, simple terms, um, asking us like, what gives you energy? Um, like what, what are the things that make you tick? Um, and what are the things that feed your soul? And, uh, and really like simple words describe to us what that feels like. And so a lot of like people have said like nature or love or friendship, um, just kind of those things that like really ground you and like give light to your life, I think is a really good way to define spirituality. Um, and that friend is Nicole, shout out Nicole, who, yeah, we love Nicole. Um, <laughs> so, and after you introduce yourself, make sure to popcorn it to someone else um, and they can introduce themselves. So yeah, my name is Morgan. I'm one of the Hardcover Hotties admin. I use she, her pronouns. I'm currently in Columbus, Ohio. Um, and yeah, my answer I would say is, yeah, love. I think that love is just the thing that makes the world go round. Loving friendship is the most beautiful thing in the world. And I think that is what makes me so happy every day in just the simplest terms ever. Yeah. Um, I'm going to pass it on to um, Stephanie. Yeah. Sorry, me or Stephanie Herrera? That's, you can go. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I will also piggyback off of the same love answer. Oh, sorry. I should also introduce myself first. I'm Stephanie Navarro. I am in Chicago, Illinois. Um, love the hardcover hotties. Um, yeah, gonna piggyback off of the love answer and say love is so big this year. It is 100% just what has been making every day feel like awesome. Platonic love, romantic love, friendship, it's real. Love is real. And I will pass it on to um, Miss Lauren. Hi everyone, I'm Lauren. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, and I'm also in Columbus, Ohio, and I'm a Hardcover Hotties admin. I'm really excited to be here today. Um, my answer to this question, I think I'm going to go with the nature route. Um, nature and friendship together, love that, love when that happens. Um, and I also think creative expression too. So yeah, and I will popcorn it to Stephanie Herrera. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is also Stephanie. I use she, they pronouns, and I'm coming to you also from Chicago. Um, and I really like this question a lot. I feel like for me lately, it's been movement and not, not necessarily moving through exercise, but kind of just I've been paying attention to how fidgety I can be sometimes, whether it's like literally cracking my fingers or my back all the time. Um, but yeah, I've really been loving taking moments to just dance and listen to music and see how those two like balance each other out. 
and that's really been feeding my soul lately and make me making me like appreciate the mobility of my body um and i'm going to popcorn it to ella hi guys um my name is ella i use she her pronouns um and i'm from boston or i'm in boston currently um i go to school here but this is also my first meeting with hardcover hotties, um, and I'm really excited to be here. I've been super interested for a while, and um, I'm happy to to have joined today. Um, and I love this question so much. I feel like there are so many things that have been popping in my mind, but I think um, the answer I'm going with has been, or is going to be collaboration, because um, I was thinking like creativity, but then also like bouncing ideas off of people and like the energy that comes along with collaborating with like a big group of people and everybody um having their own voice and creative expression I just think is really powerful so yeah and um I'm gonna popcorn D hi guys sorry my video's not working I don't know what's wrong with my laptop um I'm D I use they, she pronouns. I'm currently in Columbus, Ohio. And I was not here for the question just for most of your guys' answers. So I don't really know what the question is. Can anyone answer for um, like? It's in the chat, D, but I can send it again if you can't see like. It says name pronouns and where you are right now. Oh, oh, oh okay, twice. thank you. Thank you. Okay. What has been feeding my soul? I, not to rip off Stephanie Herrera, but like dancing around has been like really good for that. And like helping and reading too. Like I've been reconnecting a lot with like reading and reading things that are challenging me. And like, I just feel so much smarter and more confident and like opened up to the world because of it. So like, those things are really feeding my soul right now. Um, yeah, I think that is my answer. And I will popcorn it over to Charles Van Leuven. Howdy, everyone. I'm Charles. I use he, him pronouns. Currently in St. Louis, Missouri, my hometown. Um, what feeds my soul? Um, today I went for like a seven mile trail run in the Missouri wilderness. Um, that really did, that really worked. Uh, it's nature magic on me. I was feeling really disconnected. How to get out there to nature. I will popcorn it to Ellen. Hi everyone, I'm Ellen. Um, I'm also a hardcover hotties admin and I use they, them pronouns. Um, I'm also in Columbus, Ohio, still an OSU student, hopefully finishing in May. Um, what feeds my soul? I, D similarly was going to say, um, dancing alone, which I picked up on from living with Stephanie, <laughs> um, because yeah, it's it just feels so good to be by yourself and like have your headphones on and just dancing. Um, and I also think like sitting outside, like on my porch or something alone, I really enjoy being like in those moments by myself because um, it feels very connecting to like my surroundings. Um, yeah, I'm going to popcorn it to Alejandra. Hi everyone, I'm Alejandra. Um, I use she, her. I'm here in Chicago right now, um, all the way on the like super north side. And, um, I think a thing that has been bringing me connection, feeding my soul right now is creative practice I have been like kind of crazy all summer and into the fall and like not having a ton of time to do things for myself but like there's been like a couple of times where I've just been able to like knock out like essays that I wanted to write or things like that and just every time I do it I'm like oh yeah this is this is like what it's actually there for and that's been really nice um I will pass it to Emma 
Hi, um, I'm Emma. This is my first time here and I'm really excited. Um, I use she, her pronouns. I am a little bit north of Columbus right now in Powell, Ohio. Um, and this is also piggybacking off of earlier answers. Um, but I guess for me recently, it's been like learning to love people from afar. Um, cause I went to school in Boston, um, and just like learning to love my friends from afar. Um, and I, I grew up with my grandparents and they just moved back to Bosnia. Um, so like continuing our relationship from afar. And that has really been like, even though we're not all together anymore, it just really like, I don't know, it feeds my soul to be able to interact um, with the people that I love throughout the day, even though we are so far apart. So thank you, technology, for that. Um, but yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I popcorn to Aaron. Hi, I'm Aaron. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm in Columbus, Ohio right now. Um, not to like, take the prompt too literally but right now what's really feeding my soul is just like sharing food with friends like my roommate like I think because it's fall she's been making like stews and stuff that just like make the whole house smell so good and then I made like apple turnovers last night for her and everything and it just it feels so good and I don't know I feel like that's just such a great I don't know a great connection and a great kind of creation to share with each other and all popcorn to Johnny. Have you gone? Hi. Um, this is also my first meeting. Um, my name's Johnny Elder. I use he, him pronouns, and I'm also from Columbus, Ohio. Um, I just met Lauren and Morgan earlier today at Cartoon Crossroads Columbus. Um, I'm gonna have to go with nature too. I um, grew up on a farm out in the country, far away from everyone. And while I love the city, just traipsing around an old forest uh, that <laughs> has been really, I don't know, motivating for me. And I would like to do it again sometime soon. Um, I also, I haven't read the book yet, but it's on my list and I'll take the conversations that y'all have into reading it soon. <laughs> um, okay, who hasn't gone? Aria? Yeah, um, I'm Aria, she, her pronouns. I'm in Columbus, Ohio. And my answer, I think for one of like the first times in my life I've been feeling a lot of community recently so I feel like that has really been nice and going along with that like just quiet moments of like being by myself where I feel like entirely as myself have been really precious Martin, have you gone? Yeah, I've gone. I think that Douglas, Sophia, and Brit, I believe that's River, ha still have to go. Okay, I'm popcorn at you, Douglas. All right. Hey, everyone. My name is Douglas. I use he, him pronouns. Um, I am also here in Columbus. Um, and I think one thing that has been, or a couple things that has been feeding my soul recently um, has been being outside. I've been trying to go like on walks every, like every other day in my like area recently, which has been helpful. And then also listening to music has been really helpful. And then like they brought back the daily playlist thing on Spotify. So I've been taking into account like a lot of the words that have been describing like how I'm feeling in the morning or the afternoon or the evening and stuff. And thinking like, okay, maybe this, this is going to be and then like kind of thinking about um, how I go about my day. Um, and so that's been really helpful. Um. Yeah, I will pass it on to Sophia. Can everyone hear me? Oh, 
Okay. Wait, everyone, I'm sorry. I'm on my phone, so. Yes. Okay, cool. So I think I'll probably bounce off that, and I'll say that, like, something that's been feeding my soul is probably – being outside, I've gone camping a lot this summer and in the fall too. And I'm not necessarily like, a, like, oh, I'm going to go rock climbing type of person. Like, I've just been going out and it's really nice to just like not, you know, like be on your phone and be around people like in a very like simple way. I don't know. So I'd have to say that. Um, so who else hasn't gone? Or um river hasn't gone okay well i'm popcorning river hello um <laughs> pardon my birth name on zoom but my name is river um <laughs> um i use he him pronouns um i'm also here in columbus and i joined late and so i'm so sorry but know that i'm so excited to be here um something that feeds my soul would be spending time with my roommates. I've recently moved into a house with three other people for the first time and being able to have hobbies that I share with them and engage in them in a common space that we all share has become very important to me. And I like it a lot. I've been trying to do a lot more of it, so. Okay, thank you guys for taking the time to introduce yourselves. Um, so obviously we're all gathered here today to talk about Rivermouth. And I'm just, I feel so incredibly grateful and excited to have Alejandra Oliva here. And just to, I feel like interacting with authors and someone who like you spent so much time with their work and get to just like actually have that conversation is just so valuable and unique. So thank you for taking the time again to be here with us today. Um, so a little background on Rivermouth. Um, this book really just takes us through Alejandra's experience working as a translator at the U.S.-Mexican border, um, helping asylum seekers with their credi credible fear interviews and trying to offer um, support um, and through while working in a system that often seems to work in like contradiction to that support. So among some of the topics that are covered, because I feel like we definitely get like a large amount of information throughout, um, we talk about language and how people like interpret it differently, um, translation, faith, migration, um, other political issues that really like add to the stress that comes um, at varying levels throughout like the immigration process. And yeah, there's definitely a lot of material that we can cover and hopefully a lot of themes that probably stood out to you guys. Um, in the chat, we're gonna be sending a list of some of the discussion questions that we also shared um, on our Instagram meeting reminder. But to start us off, I'm just gonna start by asking, um, about like the structure of the book and a little bit about like the introduction so in the book Alejandra talks about um, her reasons for adding Spanish without translations like um, interjected throughout varying parts of like the texts so for non-Spanish speakers what was that experience like reading in a language that wasn't your own and how did it challenge you what did it make you think or feel or what was the process of like finding that information um out like for you and for people who have like who do know spanish also what was it like working with a text that opens that like level of like conversation around the accessibility of language Okay, I'll talk. So I feel like um, it, I 
took Spanish throughout like my schooling like they had us do it in middle school and um and that was the language I took in high school and it was really like it felt like the first time and this is a luxury for me obviously like it felt like the first time I actually uh, had to apply what I like had learned like in my Spanish classes because I feel like there's a isolation like they don't have us learn language here in a way that like you do it in a community outside of the classroom. So because like Spanish, like I, I didn't have a lot of access to people like who had were from Latin American like families and like had that culture. Like I, it wasn't being used ever. So it felt like it was like really refreshing and challenging to like have to jog my memory of that knowledge. And also like it, it like made me feel I liked being put in the position to do that, like, and especially with one of the reasonings that I loved was that, like, a lot of the immigrants crossing over, they have to translate everything for them, also often, like, alone by themselves, and they have to do it to survive and to, like, have these asylum applications go through and all that other stuff. So it's, like, it felt like having to use that translation towards a goal, like, a really practical goal, which is like reading this book. Granted, it's definitely not as high stakes, but like it would, it felt, it was just awesome. I don't know, like it, and it also like made me realize how important that like application is because there was a lot that I did recognize and I was surprised at like my ability to like understand a lot of what I read. Um, yeah, that was my experience. Um, I also do not speak Spanish uh, and I had taken it in like grade school, I think, but I didn't take it in high school either. So I really don't have like too much of a working knowledge of the language. Uh, so for the larger sections, when I would go about like trying to translate them and also with the knowledge that like online translation systems aren't always accurate, like it it's really like took time and intentional effort to like try and contextualize everything too because like obviously you can't just plug into google translate like you'll get an idea but it's not like the same um so having to do that to understand like the narrative and what was going on through the chapters like kind of put me in the headspace of it put me in a good um like headspace for reading the rest of the book and like taking in it made me experience that and then i'm like going through the rest of the book with the experience of having to translate something out of necessity even though it is in the context like you said like of a book like ultimately um it's like a very it's my safety is not like contingent on me translating what's in the book but my knowledge of what's going on is so yeah I would say um recognizing like time and intention Um, so I wanted to comment on that too, because for me, as someone who does speak Spanish and, um, just is like working with it, like pretty often reading the, the section on the book being like unapolog unapologetically like bilingual, um, my jaw actually dropped and I took a picture and I sent it to Douglas, I think. And I was like, there's just no way I'm so excited. Like, what is this going to mean for the book? I've like never um, had that experience. Well, actually I have worked with like texts that have like Spanish like added throughout, but not the kind of like um, direct address from like an author that's kind of like saying like, hey, this is why I'm doing it. And I know this is like a text, like a, there's this author named Jamaica Kincaid and the work that I'm thinking of is A Small Place and that author works um, speaking like directly to the audience and kind of just saying um, like the assumption is that the reader is like a privileged um, white person and saying like oh you're going on vacation and you're doing all of these things um, and this is like the intention and you kind of feel like called out a little bit so I feel like from my own perspective like reading this I was like whoa 
what is it gonna I'm like really interested to hear what it's like for non-Spanish speakers to like hear something like that because I'm used to bridging that gap for other people rather than um it being like this path already set for me where it's like this is going to be the norm and uh, that's just like not often the case so it was really exciting to get to see that and uh, yeah I liked the a lot of the conversations around like Spanglish and kind of the be, like the surface level of language and what it means to know language and then the second level of knowing all of being able to like manipulate language in whatever way you want because you know it so well so the way we're all used to in English with um, having like our own like funny words or like misspelling things on purpose, which obviously complicate things so much for um, non-native like English speakers who are trying to get into this popular culture. But in the same way, I know that Stephanie wasn't able to st stay for really too long in the meeting, but her and I talk a lot in Spanish that's very like manipulated and like spelling things incorrectly because of a lot of our like, a lot of our favorite musicians. I'm thinking of um, Rebe, which I feel like I talk about all the time with my friends, but she always titles her music and spells things wrong. Like um, her most famous song, like Wapa is like W-A-P-A. And all those things are, are just make you feel part of like that in-group. So getting that acknowledgement in like the beginning of this book was just really meaningful. Something that I'm curious about is if you felt like that unapologetic bilingualism like was actually a, a promise fulfilled throughout the rest of the book. Like, did you feel like that was true? Did you feel like it carried through? I feel like I'm both like, yeah, it was unapologetically bilingual, but then there are a lot, a lot of spaces where I also gloss or I provide explanations and stuff. And I'm like, a really ap unapologetically bilingual book wouldn't have done that but also like and like my editors were very cool about me including as much Spanish as I wanted and kind of doing that but I also like recognized that the vast majority of the book reading public in the U.S. is not Spanish speakers and so there were some concessions made so I was just wondering like how y'all felt about that. I haven't been, no I, oh, an <laughs> oh, I haven't finished the book completely, but I also think in terms of like including notes and stuff like that, you are also trying to get a message across to the readers as well. So I mean, as much as you are being like unapologetically like bilingual, which I think you did like stay true throughout the book, I think the notes for like people to actually go out and, you know, explain to others is like why they should read this, like why they should do this. I think those like context clues and stuff are really helpful to have in the book as well. Um, just so that you can kind of persuade the the reader to like go out and 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 you know like tell the story or like explain it if that makes sense. Yeah, totally. Yeah, I think I had, was thinking a similar thing to Douglas, um, and that the throughout the book you communicated almost like hidden meanings um like that are often lost through translation and I am not a Spanish speaker so I was often doing the thing we're putting it into Google Translate and like not getting the full the full context of what I was reading or taking what I had learned from French and trying to <laughs> to like see <laughs> if it like uh matched in some way but it was like I think the yeah I think like for like that was really really helpful because I think there were a lot of things that I wouldn't have understood if there hadn't been like what I'm thinking of is like the um when you were talking about I believe it was your dad's jokes and it was like uh I think that was like really helpful because it 
yeah really just um you you unveiled the secrets behind like the the language that are often lost through translation and um yeah it was really exciting to be able to like be to see into that world like as somebody who isn't closely familiar with um with Spanish as a learner I feel like there were definitely sections where it was necessary to do that too. Um, right away, I'm thinking of the section on ice and talking about the different ways on like why that, that name is so meaningful and like what connotations that can carry depending on the group. And yeah. again, as a Spanish speaker, and someone whose parents are like, just like always have the news on, so I see stuff about ice and like those references a lot. Yeah. It, I, I was like, oh yeah, people know this. And then when I was hearing like the full interpretation, I was like, wait, I'm wondering how many people this is like their first time like realizing, um, the different connections. And one of the artists that we share, that we shared for like our media map that she's like based in Chicago. She has like this one piece that's like pretty popular and like stickers of it too, but it's ice and it's also like a cage and it's melting and it's just such a great piece. And there's just so many layers behind her piece. And yeah, I felt really like appreciative of like that type of artwork and also the explanation behind it because it does open the doors for so many people to see the significance and be able to like appreciate to a different degree the activism and the way that people who are working to like combat these systems are like subversing like the meaning to what is being shared by like the government. Yeah. Um, I don't want to totally hijack this meeting and I can't stay on much longer, but I wanted to give you all like an opportunity to ask questions or anything like that before I hop off. Um, so yeah, if y'all have any questions for me, I would be super glad to answer them. Um, I had a question. So you talked a little bit, well, a lot about um, religion and faith and kind of it being interwoven um, with the experiences of like just working with people at the border and just praying with others. Um, and I haven't, I'm about two thirds through the book. Um, and I apologize if you talk about this later in the book. Um, but I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit, like, did you ever have an experience where you were um, just like wondering how people can have such like strong faith, like in facing really terrible circumstances and how you kind of wrestled with that and, and dealt with that and your observations? But, yeah. yeah, all the time. And like, I would be meeting people who were like in the middle of these horrible processes or like had been through really bad things and then would be like, God is good. God is great. Like, I've been so blessed in my life. And you'd be sitting there, like, having just listening, listened to the most harrowing story. And you'd be like, it, is he? Are we sure about that? <laughs> um, and it's just one of those things that you're like, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know how you got there. And it's somewhere that, like, I, in my very, very privileged life, like, have not been able to get to. Like, I don't... I'm at a place I think right now where like religion is very important to me, but I'm not actually religious, if that makes sense. Like I can't be like, I'm not like a believer, but I do think about it all the time. Um, and so like for them to be able to just like have that faith, take that leap has always been wild to see and like something that doesn't always fit inside of like, my own faith or like my own understandings of how the world works but also like 
it's all about what gets you through the day and gets you through the hard situations and like that's it for a lot of people thank you yeah I have a question and I think it can kind of tie in some ways into like um the question before sorry I forgot your your name already um I so I wanted to ask if you have because there was a couple times in the story where you talked about um how you like via Facebook or like other social media saw like certain families that were like together like the kid on the beach with like growing up I don't know is are there do you have any other like stories or things that particularly speak out to you or that like moved you whatever that like of these like moments where you got to see the people who you like helped like do you have that or, yeah, or do you have any yeah there's a couple of people so Sarah in the book is someone that I'm still in touch with and like she is living in Canada she actually like probably like a month or two after or right before the book was published um she like reached back out to me to let me know that she had won asylum in Canada and so like that's where she and her kiddo are living and like just fucking great never ha or I mean it does happen but it's just like unusual and then um while I was writing this book and right after I was working at the National Immigrant Justice Center which is here in Chicago it's a big legal aid nonprofit and so through that I got to talk to a lot of different people who were since I was on the communications team and not doing like lawyering, I talked to people who were on the far side of their immigration processes usually. Like we didn't really do communications or storytelling work with people who were in the middle of their cases because like that's still a very tenuous situation. Things can break all kinds of ways. And so we mostly just worked with people who had won their cases or who had like won one kind of protection, like a visa or something and then we're trying to get a green card or a citizenship and kind of like moving along that process even further but had a base level of security and safety and so talking to people who were in those situations I think there's one person specifically um Johannes Fabi who is an activist here in Chicago and he when I met him had just gotten out of immigration detention in Indiana um right at the beginning of COVID and like was just a really bad situation he had gotten out because he had like uh, a medical condition that made it really really challenging or like a really bad idea for him to be in a space with uh unmitigated COVID spread and no protections and today Johannes is on the board of like eight different immigration uh, uh, nonprofits here in Chicago. He is a Detention Watch Network fellow, um, which is an organization that looks out or does a lot of like watchdog work with uh, immigration detention sites. Um, he just directed his first documentary um, that is interviews of people who have been in immigration detention, including sharing his own story. Like he's just someone who like got out of immigration detention, has been working on winning his case, and then almost immediately turned around and was like, I have a story, I have a voice, I'm going to start sharing and talking uh, to other people about it. And so like, for me, and like, that happens all the time. People who like, immediately end their immigration stories, I'll be like, talking to them, be like, hey, like, how's it going? How's it so good? And they're like, yeah, good. I have this neighbor that also needs help can you help me get her an appointment like it happens all the time Johannes is just someone who has done it on like, like a huge very visible public scale but like the amount of times that I've talked to people who have just wrapped up their immigration cases and are immediately like I have six cousins a neighbor and two friends and like you're like yeah bring them in why not let's do it Um, I have a question kind of building off of um, the last one a little bit. I wanted to ask about your perspective on like building archives and building a history, but I also wanted to talk about in chapter 24, um, 
it's the part where you say I'm not in league with you reader there's a way in which I'm playing coy and like that uh whole segment so I kind of wanted to ask how you balance building an archive out of people's like personal like histories and like traumas and stories and everything while holding that like kind of coyness and space for them and kind of like how you built that perspective up and carry that with you yeah so it's one of those really I'm in like a particular positionality in relation to these stories which is to say I do not like I have U.S. citizenship I am in no danger of deportation getting in trouble with immigration authorities any of that I'm also not the person that these things happen to. And so like Sarah's story, for example, is one that comes to you because I was able to talk to her throughout the process of writing. I was able to, like the version of your story, of her story that you get is one that is anonymized in a lot of ways. Like there are a lot of details that come, got pulled out. There are a lot of things that got switched around. Um, so like you get a general idea of it and a lot of the like important emotional beats but you don't get a lot of things that where you could be like I'm gonna plug these six things into a search engine and I bet an individual human will pop up um and so she is someone that I worked really closely with there are a lot of stories in part two that are fully anonymous and those are fiction and like they are close to other stories I have read they some of them are based on stories that I've read in the news of people who have already shared what happened to them um but a lot of them are not things that you can like trace back to an individual person or like a story that was told to me altogether. and like I've been surprised by how many people are like how did you get access to these recordings and I'm like they're not I wrote them out of my brain. Um, but I think that there is room in the archive, both for the stories that people are choosing to tell in the media in places like that. And I tried to also pull in as many of those as I could. Um, I think I talk about like Roxana Hernandez, who's a trans woman who is um, essentially killed by ICE. Um, through a combination of like a physical beating and medical neglect. Um, I try to pull in as many of those stories as I could where it was very like public and active and, and a story that was either shared with consent or like shared by their families with consent in the case that the person is no longer around to share it with consent. Um, but then I also tried to share and shout out as many of directly affected individuals who have chosen to tell their own stories, Carla Cornejo Villavicencio's um, The Undocumented Americans, Javier Zamora Solito, Marcelo Hernandez Castillo's Children of the Land. There are a ton, a ton, a ton more books of people who have been through these same things, who have chosen to write about um, their lives as undocumented people. And I tried to share those as much as possible. And I think that like that goes into the archive along with like, this is my own experience as someone who is sitting outside of that process, but like next to it and seeing people go through it and seeing like the multiplication of the individual traumas in a way that like, I don't think you see that much if you are inside the system itself. Cool, thank you. Um, I had a question and my question kind of revolves around the scarcity mindset that a lot of people tend to have in terms of like people with passion towards the wor work and like volunteers and nonprofits and other radical spaces that often at times can lead to like some suspect behavior that you witness. Um, as someone who has been in those spaces and interacted with people like that, how how do you do it? How do you move past it for a common goal? Um, what's what's the professional way to go about it? The personal, like any any advice on that? Because I I feel like a lot of people can, uh, especially people who like personally relate to whatever issue like aligns. Um, like the work that's going on 
to be able to like suss suss that kind of behavior out. Can you say a little bit more about what you mean by that? Sorry, I just want to make sure that I'm like answering the question you're asking. Yeah. So how do you work and cope with like um yourself to like meet that common goal with those types of individuals um just like in a professional and like personal sense because I know it can be very taxing at times when you are experiencing like those types of behaviors like you talk about with like other um translators and like the way they were um interacting with like friends but not really helping as much um yeah sorry if I'm phrasing that poorly no no that makes sense so like people who are like sort of like oh shush shush like I've got this I'm going to like handle this conversation for you you just sit there and like not worry and they're like no I'm extremely worried this is my own personal life that we're talking about and yeah okay um I don't know if I've totally figured that out and like this is a person that you run into all the time in like nonprofit settings radical space like all these spaces where you're like oh we're here to help and they're like I'm going to help the most and I'm going to do that by making the people I'm helping be very very small and manageable and contained and you're like I mean that makes your job easier I guess but like it's not actually helping it's making people small in the exact same way that like the system does and I don't know if I found like a great way to work with that or work against it other than being like the person who like redirects and tries to pay attention and be like wait hold on it looks like the friend is trying to speak for the record I know that this is one of your questions I feel super weird about the choice of like friend as the moniker that we used in clinic like it you're like yes it's better than being like my client or like my asylum seeker person that I'm helping but it also just like is so chummy in a weird way that like I'm like I'm not your friend I am a random person that you're meeting on a Tuesday night and like we are not going to text after this like or like we might but that's very unusual Anyway, it's also, like, the least weird way I found of saying, like, this other person who is here in this very particular, like, kind of relationship that is not friendship, but is something. Um, and so it, like, being the person who redirects and it's like, hey, I think the friend is trying to say something or like I think this person is trying to talk or like oh wait she has a question like let's listen to her and like doing that work and like sometimes you're on a team where you're able to do that where it's like a couple of volunteers and one person and then sometimes you're just like looking over down the table at like the couple of people who are working together next to you and you're like oh that is not going well and I do not know how to step in without overstepping my bounds um but yeah I don't I don't have like a great answer to that and like pretty much every job or situation I've been there's been like some volunteer person that I'm like um but yeah it's a very incomplete answer but it's a complicated situation to deal with like at the end of the day yeah, I think I have time for one more before I hop off, so. I have one more question, but if anybody else has one that hasn't asked a question yet, I don't want to take the time up, um, but I do have a question. Okay. Um, yeah, so I guess I was just wondering, um, so you talked about kind of experiencing secondhand trauma um, from working with people who had really experienced some really difficult events in their lives. Um, and I'm wondering, like, on days that that felt really heavy, um, how did you kind of rest and heal from that so that you were able to return and provide like the same quality of like advocacy and, and like ability to empower people in the same way and not kind of carry that 
heaviness with you, I guess. Yeah, um, I did a lot of journaling around that time and like there's probably pages in my journal that like break confidentiality in some pretty serious ways, but like no one is reading those. Um, I also watched a lot of TV, like specifically things that I had already watched, like the comfort TV show really plays a role here because like, again, we do a lot of romance novels also like very like you know exactly what the plot's going to be you know like the hiccups they're going to have and like it's just like boom 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 it's very like predictable there's always a happy ending it's like very sweet um sometimes there's like traumatic elements but like you can kind of choose your genres and like find stuff that is generally not going to have super serious elements brought in um and so things like that um that made things feel very predictable and safe and comforting in like a plot kind of way and then also like journaling talking to friends um and like resting and not engaging with things as much as I could like on the days when I didn't have clinic or on the days where I was like not there um there's like always this temptation to sort of go back in there and read as many news articles as you can and like do all this research and like there's a point at which that's helpful and there's another point at which like it's not and you kind of have to figure out what that means or what that looks like for you but there is definitely a point where you cross past being well informed and into like hurting your own feelings and and hurting yourself somehow um and so figuring out where that was for me was pretty important um and that's something that also applied to the writing of the book like there would be days where like the immigration landscape was looking particularly fucked up and I'd be like this is a week that I don't work on the book this is a week in which I like don't engage with these ideas outside of like my job or outside of the work that I need to be doing and so figuring out those balances between like I can do this work to a certain extent and then past that I am like hurting my own ability to be helpful or like I can write this book to a certain extent and after that like it's not going to be good writing anymore it's just going to be like letting off steam I will say that I wrote most of part three the summer of 2020 while like extremely angry the whole time and I think that shows a little bit in the book and like it also changed the least from like when I first wrote it to the version that appears in the book and like sometimes that can work for you but other times like you have to step away and I think knowing the difference between the two is challenging but important thank you so much thank you and thank you so much for having me you guys this was great and uh again I can't tell you how much I appreciated all of the like incredible content y'all put together around the book and like all of the care and attention that you all put into everything like truly such an honor and thank you so much for having me Thank you so much. Good luck to you in organizing for your class. Uh, what class is it, by the way? Um, I am teaching a six-week like online professional studies class through NYU's School of Professional Studies on community access to interpretation and translation. So like very on the nose for what I'm writing about. Awesome. Um, good luck. Just a quick plug for anybody that's in Chicago. Later this month in October, um, Alejandra is actually going to be at Pilsen Community Books um, speaking. Can you please remind me who else you will be speaking with? It is with? Jasmina Barrera who wrote this book in vitro that is, I think, about being pregnant. I haven't read it yet. Um, or like trying to get pregnant. Um, and then actually, I know that one of y'all was from Boston. I'm speaking or like in conversation at Harvard Divinity School on October 12th. So like two weeks from now. Um, and that is open to the public. So yeah. 
thank you so much. Thank you so much. Please have a good rest of your day and weekend. All right. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was her. That's just our oh. friend. Well, since she since she just left, how did it feel to be able to hear directly from the author? Um, uh, yeah, <laughs> or what? What like stood out for you for like what she was saying? I will say that we did find out that she was gonna be here like two hours ago. So we didn't have like um like I feel like I had to like emotionally prepare for that. Like I was like, yeah, that was just so cool. Like I feel like celebrity meetup literally, like I feel so grateful that we got to talk to her and she was just so willing to like answer questions and yeah, so cool. It's always, like, so awesome to talk to, like, artists, creators, authors, whoever that's, like, actually making and producing the work, like, in real time, and you're along there with it, um, because obviously that's, like, a really valuable perspective to have, especially after a work is released, too. Um, it's just really nice. It's really nice to get the insider information. Um, yeah, and to, like, hear her perspective, especially, like, it would just be crazy to be an author and to write a book and then have people read it like that would be it's crazy both ways you know yeah I really liked how much more of like her person like obviously we get her personality in the book but it's still not like 3d in the same way that like literally speaking to her not really face to face obviously but zoom to face is like I don't know it's just like I kind of want to go back and and reread very soon and like actually like see her in my mind's eye like because I know she tried to like erase herself but she she also didn't in a lot of ways and I I think it'll be interesting to fully see her and like kind of gauge more of that like humor pick up on certain things now that like we've spoken to I feel like um it's so humanizing to to kind of like and whenever I ask a question, I'm like, oh, am I saying something right? Or like, I wonder if this came off the way I thought. And then we kind of got to see that mental framework mirrored right back because she was like, guys, friends, I don't know. It felt so weird to write about. What did you guys think? Like, what did you think about that? And it's kind of a great way to like give feedback because yes, she literally, it, this is her debut. This is her debut that we got to interact with. And there, I feel like there's definitely just so much le learning that comes out of it. And um like audience like feedback that like might influence like further writings or like change like the the direction of work in like certain ways um I had no idea that a lot of like the quotes and stuff like the transcripts weren't were like fictional like that made me think a lot about um Carmen Maria Machado and like how she kind of went on those like diatribes and like her writing um that you kind of like didn't know what to trust and it builds a lot with like the unreliable like narrator and yeah even though this has like memoir-esque like elements there's just how do you really trust something when like a lot of people can't even we're like taught to be taken out of like mindfulness and that's what like capitalism like forces us into and then people can't remember what they ate for breakfast like that morning so to recount like the most traumatic information and try to make it accessible and get like a, a publisher to pick up on it and like being able to like really hold that meaning is just so such an intense 
tasks to take on but she ate despite the odds she ate and I think that's why it's just so amazing too that publishing like independent publishing companies can like offer this to new generations of writers because a lot of like traditional publishing companies will like editors will want to like take like the flesh off of a piece and uh, kind of like this dishonor like the work like the original intention of like the creator but here we're able to get anger like pettiness really like hum human emotions that like make a work just so much more meaningful so that was just awesome i was like fangirling um i don't know if they're fanboying um i was like i had a lot of like kind of like per like i just wanted to know more about her experience with like legal aid and that stuff that was like I was just too nervous to ask but i just finished the book and i was just like you're so cool but i didn't want to i didn't want to be that that person um but this it was literally so freaking cool to hear from her i'm so glad she had a chance to come by can i say something or how i'm sorry this is the first time i've ever done this so I just want to say I'm really happy to be here. So can everybody hear me? I'm sorry. Okay, yeah. So I'm really happy I like came to this. Um, I have not read the book, unfortunately, but I will read read it regardless after this. And I was like really intimidated that she was here because she just seems like a really like smart woman. I was reading, I'm trying to get more like better at like finishing like books and I was reading Karma Maria Machado's book and like I don't know I'm just excited to like read the next one but yeah I was like really intimidated that she was here it was like super cool I, I didn't know she was gonna be here either so but I do want to like take notes and stuff more while I'm reading and like I think that's like practicing mindfulness Yeah, I think that I'm, like, almost done with the book. I have, like, a few chapters left. Um, and I'm, like, incredibly thankful that she came because I feel that the experience finishing the book is going to be something very unique and, like, separate from the way that it felt to read the first, like, portion. Um and yeah just having her here was like really really cool and special and I feel very 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 grateful to be in this space with with everyone okay I wanted to ask one of the questions from that we like sent in the chat earlier that really caught my attention and just like a part of the book that caught my attention but she talks a lot about her experience working with a woman who felt like super super comfortable talking to clients and being like super loving and just um uh, using like references to how like someone in a diner might be like oh honey like what are you doing today or like oh you just look so cute and how like safe and caring like those spaces can feel um the question is in what ways do you communicate warmth care attentiveness attentiveness and safety in your language and where did you learn these skills and just maybe like not even just through language too um how do you communicate that to people that you might know like immediately and larger circles because I feel like there is a little bit of like taboo of, of opening that line of intimacy with someone that you don't that isn't like in your immediate circle but there also is just so much valuable value that can come out of it too so did anyone did anyone have any comments about that or like personal experiences of like moments that really captured that And just just for quickly, sorry, 
You said in our personal lives? Okay. Um, one of the, something that came to mind for me, like as I was reading this, um, there were a lot of things because I think that like active listening is like a really difficult skill to learn, um, especially in our world, in the world today with our short attention spans and uh, iPad babies and etc um and I think I like when as some of my good friends know I in high school I like volunteered for a crisis helpline a crisis talk line where like kids who were experiencing moments of crisis would call in on the phone and like just talk to me and it was like a really like crazy like difficult experience because I went through like weeks of training about literally how to communicate that you were actively listening over a phone like when you can't like hold eye contact and when you can't like um yeah like with touch like show that you're like caring for somebody like in a conversation and so I think those things have really stuck with me and like I think just like of course like on zoom like eye contact like I don't it's it sounds like uh it's hard because a lot of these things you do have to do actively because it is like uh you're in um it's it's work to like show actually like let somebody know that you're like listening and that you care um especially when you don't learn those things like as a young person um but yeah like using things that people say like as they talk and being like oh I hear that you're saying all of these really great things and like I this will tell me more about that and like just like using like uh remembering small bits of information I think can be really like meaningful to people especially like when you're making new friends um is something that I just love uh and because that yeah, that, that changes everything. And then also just like, um, I, yeah, I talk on the phone with an older, another volunteer thing, I talk with the, on the phone with an older woman every week. And um, like, I just like all the time, I'm just like, yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I hear you. And like those things just like, are, that means so much to her, because like, if I'm silent on the other end, she's like, where'd you go? Where'd you go? So like, I just like, conversation is something that's like always active, like even when you're not speaking, like, um, yeah, listening takes a lot of different forms. So yeah. I don't know. Sorry, I just talked for like 25 minutes just then. We were all actively listening to you. No, I um, felt it, guys. I felt it. I felt it. Um, I think, I don't know why I started talking, but I think the the um, ways that I communicate, care, um, mm, I don't know. Sometimes, sometimes it may come off as invasive I don't know but I ask a lot of questions um about people how they're doing what they like what they've done what they really like what why do they like these things like I don't know I think I try to ask a lot of questions that like make it seem like oh it's like comfortable to talk to me um also shout out uh to Morgan and Lauren because the one way that they showed care for me was by you know giving giving opening up spaces um so shout out them, shout out them. Um, but yeah, I think a way that I do it is just asking a lot of questions to make it like, and showing actual interest in asking like, oh, why do you like this? What do you like about this? Whether it could be something like I had no idea. It could be people talking about like their favorite football team and I'm be sitting there asking them 50,000 questions because that's just, yeah, you were.
Um, I was going to say, Douglas, you touched on this, but I think like holding space for people in a conversation or like if you have a little rant to go on, I'm going to let you go on that little rant and I'm going to be like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, like it feels good when other people do that for you. So it's like, OK, if you need to like work through this, I feel like I do that with my mom a lot. Like I'm a person that kind of needs to like talk through problems sometimes or or like I need to it needs to come out of my mouth and then like it'll make more sense but I'm kind of just talking out loud but another person being there and like kind of validating you through that or at least knowing like that there's like a presence there you don't even have to say anything but like a presence there that's like actively listening even if they're like not contributing the most is really awesome to have so I feel like trying to be that for people or like allowing that to like unfold um and being there can be really awesome and that's I think it's a nice way to like listen but also yeah yeah I I think it's nice that's my answer another thing um I think that being aware of like the energy that you bring to a situation can make a huge difference in how people feel heard. Um, I, I'm reflecting back on for embroideries when we made little comic strips. Um, mine was heavily informed by my experiences living with um, Stephanie and Charles and Morgan um, and other pals. Um, but like, being able to walk into a space and like you just feel that the energy is like open to like to you sharing or like like without words like you just feel that it's open um I think that's something that's like really special um and something that I try to do like in my everyday life now like just like relaxing your body when someone when you can tell that someone's like gonna come to you and be like hey I need to talk to you about something or like I've been struggling like I think releasing your own anxieties and just like being there is special another note that I think that Ellen is really good at is asking people what they need like as they need it and I think that's a really beautiful thing about like care and love and just like, um, yeah, being attentive and like saying, what can I do for you right now? Because that can be different for everyone. And sometimes a hug will suffice. And yeah, I just love that. And that could be a really, oh well, yeah, what a great way to listen and a hug. So. um I go ahead go ahead oh okay I was gonna say that something I've been thinking about a lot late lately is setting boundaries in relationships I feel like I've always been someone who's kind of had difficulty setting boundaries in a lot of relationships and always sort of had this like, I mean, I know this is something that a lot of people deal with, but just like the people pleasing, I feel like I was mistaking kindness for people pleasing for a lot of time. And so I think like right now in a lot of my relationships, I'm sort of trying to learn how kindness doesn't look like people pleasing, but actually comes with like setting boundaries and being aware of like my own needs and like how setting boundaries is difficult. But like, I feel like I've had to do it in some of the most important relationships in my life lately. And I feel like if anything, I hope that that shows that um, I care a lot about them because it's difficult. So I feel like that's been a way I've been trying to communicate that lately. Um, I think for me, any interaction that I've had, specific like specifically with people I don't know that well, that carry a lot of care, um, just like in those small interactions always leave me like starry eyed and like daydreamy after I like walk away from it and I'm like how did that person just charm my pants off 
in like two minutes um and like I'm just so impressed and it makes me think like oh how could I be more like them like what can I do and th- going back to the book I was thinking about how Alejandra describes seeing that and then trying to implement it verbatim with like her own clients and the- feeling the awkwardness behind it and being like oh that didn't come out right I'm I'm doing this but it kind of feels like a mask and then how she um found her own ways to like mold all the things that she admired from like her previous interactions and like what she saw into something that felt more suited for the way that like she interacts with people and what comes most like naturally out of her and that every time I have I have like the pleasure of having like a super emotionally fulfilling interaction that like comes out of nowhere I it's it serves like as a refresher for me to kind of just be that person that can also give get like give someone else that experience and I feel like something that this book leaves you with it kind of like is pushing you if this book had hands it would physically push you and be like okay now you read it go get up and do something about it and those types of actions and conversations and ways of like speaking and also as Morgan mentioned like actively listening are just such a direct way to rewire like the day-to-day like rat race that like we're all in of like just like being like so centered on like our own actions um and yeah, I feel like it's a it's a great way to to leave your mark on somebody and inspire. I love expressing my care for people and like random strangers. <laughs> um, I wanted to pose kind of a related question. Um, I think that we sent earlier in the chat which I can send again um but throughout the book um yeah it it I agree that it was it's a book that pushes you and just tangibly it puts some level of inspiration into into our hearts and minds um just because her words are just so beautiful and amazing and uh she talks a lot about how I think it was like in the at the end of um the book in the third section and then kind of in the afterward portion she talks about like the um work that can be done to improve the world and um so like in what spaces do you find yourself collaborating um collabor- collaboratively dreaming and imagining futures and in what ways do such communities most actively support this necessary work so kind of like transitioning from like at an individual level but more at like a community level um how can when do you feel like the most supported to like be able to dream and uh, imagine in collaborative spaces. And I know that um, Ella, you mentioned collaboration earlier um, and that, that, yeah, that was relevant also, so. Um, I think the first thing that come to mind, that came to mind for me was, um, a day, I'd say about a week or so ago, when I had some friends over to my apartment for the first time, and there's a playground across the street, and we all just started playing pretend and started um, like running around and um, like making up scenes and like playing like we were kids, and um, it obviously wasn't anything super um, like productive or constructive like I can't say we were really grappling with like any big ideas but I just think the concept of play felt really important um and sort of sorry there's a a very loud dog um but yeah the the idea I think of um imagination and and the sense of play when approaching um 
imagining the way a better future could be and um just like creation and art I don't know I'm like kind of still um figuring out exactly what the best ways to go about like creating a space like that is but I think also like the space to be um like the free of judgment aspect that I feel like we all had as kids when like on the playground um I think also seems like a nugget that could be really important with that kind of work and um like expressing yourself in a group of people Um, I think that is, I really, like, really relate to that idea. And I also recently had an experience playing on a play playground that was really awesome. Um, I like saw my, a lot of my like childhood best friends recently. And uh, like, we were just walking around and stumbled upon a playground. And I was like, okay, guys, we're here like might as well and it was actually so um fun and awesome and I feel like kind of broke down because we hadn't seen each other in a while it kind of like broke down like whatever not that there were like like walls up or anything like that but like it the group hadn't really like meshed yet and then we all like played on the playground and it was really awesome um and that's something that I think is um true in like our team for hardcover hotties is like I feel like bringing like fun and play to the table and like incorporating those as like values that you can build like productive relationships from um or like based on is is really important um and it opens the door for imagining those kinds of futures that you actually do want and like it kind of does take you out of that Stephanie you said earlier like the rat race like that just is so real and it's like this and it's like really you know not fun um but yeah I think that lighthearted play and fun is like a good balance it balances that out Um, I like really love to talk to like other activists who are like out there doing the work in the community. Recently, I talked to um, another legal aid guy. His um, he does like a lot of um, like immigrant tenant housing outreach because in Columbus, turns out a lot of landlords um, are really taking advantage of people who have like language. Um, gaps and like talking through solutions with him um like systemically and also like um like into his individual uh work it feels really good like it, it feels op optimistic a lot of like activist work is not really optimistic as like in the book she talked about how it can it's really easy to feel small and like the greater scheme of the problem. Um, so it's really it's really nice to talk like optim optimistically with people and also like bringing, bringing fun into spaces where not, where people won't necessarily like, that's not the first thing they feel is like important, but it is really important. Just like activism itself is a very um, like energy draining activity. So it's really important. What comes to mind for me recently um, has been interacting with people from other generations really allows me to like imagine those futures. I feel like we're taught to view older generations from like a certain lens of like, oh, um, ignorance or like there's a disconnect there like we don't fully understand. But I am like being put in more and more situations where I see how really deeply interacting with these people and listening to their perspectives and like seeing why they might hold that mentality or like what experiences shape their perspectives, what like that can offer to me as someone who either wants to like avoid this mental framework or like reach towards it. 
um a little bit with what charles was saying older activists are just have like so much knowledge because um you you're like how how do you sustain this work for a lifetime because it seems like a such like an insurmountable like task when you're young and uh, being able to imagine a future where it is part of like your day-to-day and it is being able to like interact like in between like the productivity like mindsets and like other life expectations working around is like really helpful and along with that just interacting with younger generations too I'm yeah I feel like even like teenagers like my cousins they open up my mind to like what the youth is like looking for from other older generations and just like what they're navigating like with I'm also thinking about um, the respect to the mic events that I was able to like attend and I know um, a few of you were like able to be present for there too there too but it was like a poetry reading by younger students and their teachers were in the audience and the audience was open to like all community members and they shared like their hopes and dreams through spoken word poetry and guys the waterworks were real and after that I just kept thinking about it because I was like this is um it kind of like gives you that reconnection to your own childhood self and being like what could I have used during that time and how does like my childhood experience like differ from like this other like young person's and like what can I do to be that person for you um and uh, yeah it just reinvigorates like the the energy that goes that is like needed to carry like activist work for like a long time Uh, my family is here so I'm sorry if you hear them in the background um but I like when Stephanie when you were talking I like that like completely resonated with me. I coach older adults. Um, there is like a, there's a swim team and I coach them. Um, so I'm working with a lot of people who are like 40, 50, 60 years older than me, um, which just like just graduating in May, like only being around people who are like 18 to 22, it's so different. Um, and I'm applying for law school right now and I wanna go into immigration law and I've been talking to them because we do have some immigration lawyers like or retired immigration lawyers who swim on the team and I've just been like a basket case about it um just like really scared about it um and like one thing that I was really scared about was like I I'm an immediate crier like if other people are crying I like cannot hold myself together um so I was really like stressed out about that because I feel like if you are like cry if you're a lawyer and you're crying in front of someone that you're supposed to be advocating for, you need to learn how to work through that. And I guess I was like pretty scared about that. And I talked to some of them about that. Like, how do you like get stronger, I guess, and kind of like be there for your client and just like hear them and to hear that everything is going to be okay. Um, and not like everything doesn't need to happen right now. Um, just working with older adults and like even talking with my grandparents too, like it's really helpful to like know that there is going to be a future and that like I'm going to be able to do what I like dream of doing and intend to do. I feel like cartoon crossovers today was like there's just like a lot of different stories being told there and it made me feel just like good about people in general I think that like illustrations can be really personal because they're like you know more visual and like it could like move more people but like you know like going from each booth like everyone just had something I don't know it felt all felt really like personal like some of it was like super silly like there was like calendars with like cats on it but it was like really great but then there was this one that like 
sorry I'm nervous but there's this one and like this person made this like book about like body image and they would ask people about it and they ask the person like you know I'm gonna be drawing you but I'm gonna be drawing you as animal like which animal do you like what do you want to be and then you know they they would talk about their like experience with body image and then he would draw a portrait of them after and I just like thought that was like really amazing and it like really moved me and like I thought like you know like me and this person were like very different and like I'm sure like the people in the book but we were all like I don't know it just it was like crazy and it was a lot of stuff was like small too but like I would open it and like I'd read it or like look at it and be like wow this is like this is crazy it was so cool Um, I am really interested in the connection between, like, imagination and action, because I think that that's, like, why I, I think that there can be, like, a perceived disconnect between the two, and that's why, like, imagination and, like, using that word can be really discouraged, especially in, like, academic and, like, political spaces, um, just because it sounds, like, very childish and playful and, like, using, like, creativity to describe, like, to describe, like, um, you know, the imaginary whims of, like, our brains and, like, how to, like, thinking about like all the good things that can come about and like versus like how we can translate that into like tangible work and like obviously I don't have an answer right now but I think that like there I think that there is like a really important um connection um there <laughs> uh like having like a space that like encourages like um imagination without like boundaries necessarily um and could because like having that is just like so that like fuels the soul really like talking about like like just uh something that feeds the soul um having like somebody like just being able to think about like yeah, let your letting your imagination run wild and like having people like encourage it I think is like really beautiful but like also having a space that like motivates you to like um put that into like work and like see it through I think is like really meaningful and I think that that finding bridging that gap is probably one of the most like difficult ways to like make to like build a community like that but I'm really interested in seeing like how that can happen I totally agree and that actually like everything you said Morgan reminded me a lot of I just pulled it out but there's this book that I started reading recently it's called from what is to what if and it basically talks about climate change and um how like ways to <clears throat> ways to go about imagining a better future when it comes to climate change in terms of play and there was one experience that the author was talking about where he was with a group of people and they had them all break up into groups and sort of play and imagine creating their own cities and they just totally like had fun with it like there were no boundaries to it and he said that there were multiple people who actually went on afterwards to like create companies that they had thought of and like create certain um, like integrations in their city that they totally um, just came up with during that time of play and so like I think that goes back to what you're saying about like imagination and action but there's like a certain element of like in order to take the actions you have to first have the imaginative aspect of it and I think yeah like creating a space to just play and like let imaginations run wild I think is so important but yeah book recommendation if anyone wants to read I think there's some really really great stuff in here that relates to a lot of what you guys have been talking about
something that I was thinking about with the book, also with what you just said uh, about like, yeah, just imagining those futures um, was the role of like mysticism, like the mysticism around religion and how that really like guides people towards not only like making the dangerous journey to like the United States, but also um, being able to work past like every single constraint and dream up a future where like those aren't like the, the first things that come to mind and one of the things that I really like appreciated that I had to like emphasize was the the tendency to paint migrants as like people who come with like the na naivete of like the American dream and aren't making like an informed decision at this point I mean as like someone who has like a lot of like connections to like Latin American countries and like people like their perspectives um they all know exactly how dangerous and how much um uh, people don't want migrants to come and like to the United States and like all like the warnings that come along with it yet there's something that is like either forces like within their own space or just like the ability to like imagine something like past that and um that really like calls to them and there's just so many biblical references like in catholicism and even like thinking about like the uh cross the cartoon crossroads events like with like the prince of egypt and how like those just literally like parted the river for um like everyone to be able to like walk through and make it safely like on their voyage like these these are dreams that are being like recycled again and again but like inspiring like generations like from like a very deep personal level and moved to action i don't know i kind of lost what my main point was there but it just made me think of that I guess something for me, I'm like taking the city planning class right now. And we have to do a project where we like actually go out and like do some, do like a research thing about like Columbus. And so I'm going to like talk to small business owners about like walkability and like how they want. And I guess I like, it's just like having like the push to get you to go out and talk to people and then once you're there you kind of like kind of like how Stephanie was saying with the author joining us tonight like you realize that everybody's just human and that you have like as you have just as much right to go and like talk to people and like fight for the kind of world that you want and like no one's stopping you from doing that like you can just go talk to people and like maybe it'll happen maybe it won't but there you go <laughs> Thank you everybody for your amazing comments. Um, I wanted to, as we start like wrapping up, I wanted to open the floor in case anyone else was like wanting to bring in anything else for the group. If not, um, once again, thank you so much for all of your guys' comments and insights. I feel like it's just so rewarding to be able to work with like a text independently and dream up those things. I'm like, oh, this is what I'm going to bring up during the meeting. And then being actually like in the meeting and seeing just how like conversations flow and like ideas bounce off of each other is always so fun and rewarding. Um, and we're just able to partake in in some intimacy what speaking of intimacy um it's time for us to announce the october book of the month which is drum roll okay so the october book of the month is radical intimacy by sophie k rosa um this book is basically um covering everything 
that we were talking about here. Um, so she does like a re they do like a really good job of bringing in like the importance of community work and what communities and care work looks like um, under the constraints of capitalism. And just very quickly to read like um, the contents of the book. The introduction is The Intimates is Political. Chapter one, Your Life in Your Hands. Chapter two, Us Two Against the World. Chapter three, They're All You've Got. Chapter four, A Ladder is Not a Resting Place. Chapter five, The Great Equalizer. And then the conclusion, Strong Bonds for a Fragile Planet. Um, I've made it through just like the introduction and like first chapter, but I've already just have started like dreaming up um the ways that like I want to implement everything that we talked about especially the question earlier about like um care and expressed through like again active listening or comments throughout like conversations and stuff so I really hope that you guys will check out the link below that Morgan dropped from Bookspace and join us in reading that book um bring bring your friends tell tell the world of about <laughs> the book club and we hope that we can keep spending spending time with you guys and just explore these topics um we with that we just wanted to also close off by sharing our own like guiding values that bring us to like roll out content every month and roll out like information to share with you guys so um these are our pedagogical principles and i'm gonna pass it off to morgan to start talking about our first one hey guys um i'm also gonna just say to keep out keep an eye out on the instagram because you might just get a chance to win a copy for free so of our october book of the month so yeah keep your eyes keep those bananas peeled um our first um guiding value is described as community and creative collaboration um and i think this is best understood as um collective independence being fundamental to the livelihood and liberation of our kin in our so current so social and political environment where individualism has largely advanced as the status quo. Um, and we as the club believe that community breeds um, just this creative thought that um, through constructive and positive feedback um, and the various relationships and partnerships in which we engage are um, intended to be constructed creatively, um, inspiring just this radical change that we've discussed that pre precipitates the imagining of ideal community spaces and the systems, worlds, and lives outside of those that are traditionally used to dominate and oppress. With that, I'm going to be talking about how at Hearth Over Hotties, we're prioritize, prioritizing creating a radically alternative space. So by that, we mean that we want to make up for the ways that like institutions such as like school and all of that have like hurt us and how like the traditional classroom setting might not always breed like the most like intentional work. So we want to focus on just taking advantage of like the unconventional approaches that have more focus on care and compassion and really work to challenge hierarchies and center curiosity. So as we touched on earlier, friendship and caring compassionate relationships are really important to us. Here at Hardcover Hotties, we think of friendship as active. Uh, it comes along with a dedication to the creation and maintenance of safe and inclusive spaces where both old and new friends feel valued, heard, respected, and assumes that all those who enter that space are held accountable to those standards. Um, and for us, friendship necessitates safety, comfortability, and empathy, and it is purely nurturing and compassionate. 
And finally, we have um, intention and integrity. Um, we embody integrity by interacting with um, a literary world like in a very authentic and responsible way. Um, we want our actions to emphasize transparency, um, sincerity, and like a commitment to um, like, I guess, a moral virtue. Um, and then integrity within our group involves um, recognizing um, like each individual person's responsibility and power um, and then attempting to actively transform um, that into accountability um, and holding accountability as a catalyst for personal growth um, that will foster like, yeah, an environment of honesty and goodwill and love. <laughs> um, yeah. Thank you guys so much for coming today. Um, we appreciate you guys taking the time out of your Sundays to to chat with us for a few hours. Um, and we're looking forward to seeing you all next month. Thank you, guys. Bye. -bye. Thank you all. Bye, guys. Bye, hotties. Bye. Bye.